War Horse by Michael Morpurgo. First published, Great Britain, 1982. Edgemont, UK Limited. Chapter 14. So Friedrich rode with us that autumn day when we went to war again. The gun troop was resting at midday under the welcome shade of a large chestnut wood that covered both banks of a silver glinting river that was full of splashing laughing men. As we moved in amongst the trees and the guns were unhitched, I saw that the entire wood was crowded with resting soldiers, their helmets, packs and rifles lying beside them. They sat back against the trees, smoking, or lay out flat on their backs and slept. As we had come to expect, a crowd of them soon came over to fondle the two golden halflingers. But one young soldier approached Topthorn and stood looking up at him, his face full of open admiration. Now there is a horse, he said, calling his friend over. Come and look at this one, Karl. Have you ever seen a finer looking animal? He has the head of an Arab. You can see the speed of an English thoroughbred in his legs and the strength of a Hanoverian in his back and in his neck. He has the best of everything. And he reached up and gently rubbed his fist against Topthorn's nose. Don't you ever think of anything else except horses, Rudy? said his companion, keeping his distance. Three years I've known you, and not a day goes by without you going on about the wretched creatures. I know you were brought up with them on your farm, but I still can't understand what it is that you see in them. They are just four legs, a head and a tail, all controlled by a very little brain that can't think beyond food and drink. How can you say that? said Rudy. Just look at him, Carl. Can you not see that he's something special? This one just isn't any old horse. There's a nobility in his eye, a regal serenity about him. Does he not personify all that men try to be and never can be? I tell you, my friend, there's divinity in a horse, especially in a horse like this. God got it right the day he created them. And to find a horse like this in the middle of this filthy abomination of a war is for me like finding... Uh, a butterfly on a dung heap. We don't belong in the same universe as a creature like this. To me, the soldiers had appeared to become younger as the war went on, and certainly Rudy was no exception to this. Under his short cropped hair that was still damp from wearing his helmet, he looked barely the same age as my Albert as I remembered him. And like so many of them now, he looked, without his helmet, like a child dressed up as a soldier. When Friedrich led us down to the river to drink, Rudy and his friend came with us. Topthorn lowered his head into the water beside me and shook it vigorously, as he always did, showering me all over my face and neck, and bringing me sweet relief from the heat. He drank long and deep, and afterwards we stood together for a few moments on the river bank, watching the soldiers frolicking in the water. The hill back up into the woods was steep and rutty, so it was no surprise that Topthorn stumbled once or twice. He had never been as sure-footed as I was, but he regained his balance each time and plodded on beside me up the hill. However, I did notice that he was moving rather wearily and sluggishly, that each step as he went up was becoming more and more of an effort for him. His breathing was suddenly short and rasping. Then, as we neared the shade of the trees, Topthorn stumbled to his knees, and did not get up again. I stopped for a moment to give him time to get up, but he did not. He lay where he was, breathing heavily, and lifted his head once to look at me. It was an appeal for help. I could see it in his eyes. Then he slumped forward on his face, rolled over, and was quite still. His tongue hung from his mouth, and his eyes looked up at me without seeing me. I bent down to nuzzle him, pushing at his neck in a frantic effort to make him move, to make him wake up. But I knew instinctively that he was already dead, that I had lost my best and dearest friend. Friedrich was down on his knees beside me, his ear pressed to Topthorn's chest. He shook his head as he sat back and looked up at the group of men that had by now gathered around us. He's dead, Friedrich said quietly, and then more angrily, For God's sake, he's dead! His face was heavy with sadness. Why? 
he said. Why does this war have to destroy anything and everything that's fine and beautiful? He covered his eyes with his hands, and Rudy lifted him gently to his feet. Nothing you can do, old man, he said. He's well out of it. Come on. But old Friedrich would not be led away. I turned once more to Topthorn, still licking and nuzzling him where he lay, although I knew, and indeed understood by now, the finality of death. But in my grief I felt only that I wanted to stay with him, to comfort him. The veterinary officer attached to the troop came running down the hill, followed by all the officers and men in the troop, who had just heard what had happened. After a brief inspection, he too pronounced Topthorn to be dead. I thought so. I told you so, he said almost to himself. They can't do it. I see it all the time. Too much work on short rations and living out all winter. I see it all the time. A horse like this can only stand so much. Heart failure. Poor fellow. It makes me angry every time it happens. We should not treat horses like this. We treat our machines better than this. He was a friend, said Friedrich simply, kneeling down again over Topthorn and removing his head collar. The soldiers stood all around us in complete silence, looking down at the prostrate form of Topthorn, in a moment of spontaneous respect and sadness. Perhaps it was because they had known him for a long time, and he had in some way become part of their lives. As we stood, silent, on the hillside, I heard the first whistle of a shell above us, and saw the first explosion as it landed in the river. Suddenly the wood was alive with shouting, rushing soldiers, and the shells were falling around us everywhere. The men in the river, half naked and screaming, ran up into the trees, and the shelling seemed to follow them. Trees crashed to the ground, and horses and men came running out of the wood in the direction of the ridge above us. My first inclination was to run with them, to run anywhere to escape the shelling, but Topthorn lay dead at my feet, and I would not abandon him. Friedrich, who was holding me now, tried all he could to drag me away up behind the shoulder of the hill, shouting and screaming at me to come if I wanted to live. But no man can move a horse that does not wish to be moved, and I did not want to go. As the shelling intensified, and he found himself more and more isolated from his friends as they swarmed away up the hill and out of sight, he threw down my reins and tried to make his escape. But he was too slow, and he had left it too late. He never reached the woods. He was struck down only a few paces from Topthorn, rolled back down the hill, and lay still beside him. The last I saw of my troop were the bobbing white manes of the two little halflingers as they struggled to pull the gun up through the trees with the gunners hauling frantically on their reins and straining to push the gun from behind.